Hello everybody, my name is Lisa Anderson and I am the Interim Managing Director here at the Black Cultural Archives and it's my pleasure to be in conversation with renowned artist Anthony Daly. Anthony Daly received his bachelor's degree in fine art from Wimbledon School of Art in 1982, got his master's from the Chelsea School of Art in 83 and was awarded the Pollock Krasner Painting Fellowship in 84. He's gone on to be in over 25 exhibitions internationally, including exhibitions in London, New York, Los Angeles, and Zurich. Most recently, you could have caught his work at Yinka Shonavari's amazing summer show for the Royal Academy. And he's currently on show with Gallery OCA, led by Shavis Rainford, um, with, a, with his first solo show with this gallery. So let me explain a bit about why we are in conversation with him here today at the Black Cultural Archives. Well, the Black Cultural Archives is the only national heritage centre dedicated to collecting, preserving and celebrating the histories of African and Caribbean people in Britain. Since setting up our headquarters here in 2014 at One Windrush Square in the heart of Brixton, we've made it a priority to ensure that we give people an opportunity to engage with a powerful range of archive materials. And often these are in themselves artworks. We currently have a show that addresses the power of art as archive, as well as exploring the rich cultural legacy that the Caribbean offers us through the work of Rudy Patterson, artist, actor, and model. The show is currently on here at the archives and we welcome you to come and visit it. It's running until February 26th, 2022. We've been lucky to have access to Rudy's archive of works. Sadly, he passed away in 2013, but they're so powerful that we, we wanted to play a part in giving people opportunity to engage with them. So the ex exhibition features a range of his paintings, mainly focusing on landscapes, um, including oral histories and access to new digitized material. So today, my interview with Anthony Daly builds on not only the fact that we have Rudy's works on, on show here at the Black Cultural Archives, but that there is an exciting wave of global interest in artworks from the Caribbean, especially here in London. I'm, some, I'm sure that some of you may be familiar with the fact that Tate Britain currently has a phenomenal show on at the moment called Life in Between Islands, looking at the relationship between Caribbean art and, and Britain from the 1950s onwards. But we know that history goes way back. And in, in, in essence, it excavates, you know, and looks at the way in which Caribbean and British history is inextricably, inextricably linked due to the history of the Atlantic slave trade and the result of colonial enterprise in the Caribbean. As a result of this, not only is the story of the UK uh, and the whole Caribbean region linked, but it's also a story of huge cultural exchange. And whilst this has been true for centuries, I would argue that the attention and sufficient acknowledgement of this fact hasn't been yeah, sufficient. So it's been wonderful to see this wave happen. And in that, um, Gallery OCA, which I mentioned, um, is currently exhibit exhibiting Anthony's work. Uh, it was wonderful to see them coming into fruition with their first physical show at the end of last year, featuring works by Anthony Daly. So this conversation, conversation gives us the opportunity to explore the links between Anthony Daly's work and his heritage, his Caribbean heritage, the question of archive, um, and the legacy of Caribbean work. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anthony Daly into conversation. Hi, Anthony. Well, hi, good morning again. <laughs> How are you doing? Okay, hope I'm okay. Hi, we'll see. <laughs> Looks okay. So it's, it's so... It's so great to see you in your artistic surroundings. Are we talking to you live from your studio? Yeah, yeah, it's my um, place of um, madness, I guess. <laughs> madness and 
Okay, so I have to say here that I do know of Anthony's work. I'm a big fan and um, have had the pleasure of visiting your studio. And I know that it's packed with artwork, so let's not be modest. There's a huge range of, <laughs> of output in that studio. Well, now I've been here for a long time and um, I think I kind of outlived this studio a long time ago, to be honest. It's outgrown it. But, um, you know, finances, reality and... Um, London issues and stuff like that it means I'm still here trying to um, keep producing. I don't know where to, where to put the work, and the and most of the time, um, the work is rolled away and put away before the, you know before I even see them. To be honest, so, so uh, there's just, a constant stream of art, of of work coming from that studio, which is really exciting because for me that just makes me think of archive and just the rich history that that your practice represents for you personally, but how it fits into this conversation about the legacy of artists from with Caribbean heritage, really, yeah. to, to the world of art. So I wanted to ask you, how important do you think it is right now that we have this interest in art from the Caribbean, from mainstream cultural oh. institutions, let's say? I don't know if it's a question to put to me because obviously I don't control the art world or the cultural world. And uh, but you know, obviously I'm in it. I'm alive today, painting in London. So uh, right. So uh, what's the question again? Probably, so I can get it clear. <laughs> so just to get your view on this interest. So we've got the new gallery OCA having London exhibitions. I mean that it does draw on uh, you know, an, an existing legacy of, of gallery shows looking at the Caribbean. But right now we're at the, what feels like a, a new wave of interest. So just yeah. to get your sense of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm gonna give the right, you know, good answer, or, you know, a warm answer or a cold answer, I don't know. But uh, I'm always a little bit suspicious of waves. Mm. Because I think sometimes you, you know, when you're in a, a storm, you kind of get pushed along in a ways that you don't probably, you know, it's not natural, and you, you could e easily drown when the, when the waves change and um, out of your control mm. or out of your your best interest. Um, mm -hmm. So that's maybe the negative, um, suspicious, um, but view. But uh, there is never a wrong time for people's work to be seen. Or a right time. It's always good time, I think. And um, you know, um, it was. I went to see this show at the Tate Britain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in between islands, and uh, you know, you can't help but being blown away. Basically, it's you know, it's it's a it's a wonderful collective overview scene of um, contemporary uh, painting, you know, art, fine art, whatever you want to call it. And it's, and it's, it's, very, um, it's a very sort of um, snapshot of global contemporary, you know, paintings. And, um, and on a very personal, um, well, on, on a very personal level, uh, the surprises for me, was, was you know quite beautiful, really. Yeah, because I've never really seen, for example, uh, a, a Tam Joseph painting in real life. I've known wow. it for years. We we talk a lot, and uh, but and all this, you know, look at pictures of his studio and stuff. But I never actually seen one, and um, and literally, I was blown away by his painting in the show. I just I could not move. I just sat there for a yeah. lot of the time, and. Um, and there's the, in aspects like that and seeing people's work and seeing the, seeing the work in the Tate. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't but be amazed at anything like hanging in the Tate gallery. You know, and just because, you know, it's, it's purpose, it's, it's a wonderful space to show work and uh, and it glorifies the work and, it, and, it, and it's, you know, and, you know, one day I'd like to see myself having a big show there one day. Well, yeah, let's, I, I love that you're speaking that into existence. I certainly see the need for that. Um, prior to this exhibition, Life in Between Islands, we had a phenomenal show by um, Frank Bowling at yeah. Tinkerton, you know, seen as a leading voice in contemporary painting globally. Um, just so happens to have uh, Caribbean heritage and to be a wonderful 
black artists as well. Um, so, like you, I mean, I agree with everything that you said so far in that any time is, is a good time for artists to be seen. But the fact that you hadn't seen, now Tam Joseph is a prolific artist with so much work. And I think um, a very similar work rate to yourself, you know, stores and stores of his works exist. And I, I, I'm sure that people haven't seen the majority of that collection. So this exhibition and this wave, if you like, it's just an opportunity to get more access to the conversations that that his work and other artists like him start. Are, are there any other artists um, from the show who, for whom it was a surprise to see or particular resonance there in, in the in their approach to work? Because it includes so many so many important names, so many other painters. I was I personally was really overwhelmed by the work of John Lyons in in. Yeah. Kind of, just being in the presence of his work, because I've never seen it before like that. What about you? Yeah. Having seen the show at the Tate Britain, you know, before uh, Frank Bolin's, I mean, I'm a great fan of Frank's friend, you know, sort of fan and um, admirer. And, you know, having seen his show there before, you know, that was mind blowing as well. I mean, you know, I mean, whether I'd want to take one of the pictures home and hang it in my living room, I don't know, but you can't but be, um, be impressed or be blown away by the sheer bombacity, the grandness, the scale, the beauty, the consistency, the productivity, the hard work. I mean, I was speaking to people in the show and um, people were either, none artists were in admiration of the beauty and the, you know, and the magnificence and the artist friends are, you know, were just literally wanted to go and work. Wanted yeah. To and go and work so it was moving in so many on so many different levels but uh who else um it's always great to see my old sort of students of you know chris o'philly stuff <laughs> you taught sure. chris o'philly yeah yeah okay yeah, <laughs> we, we, have, we have you to thank <laughs> yeah of course yeah. <laughs> yeah and also and also it was really good i haven't spoken to so peter doig since Oh, wow. 19, yeah. 1982, you know, I'm not sure we ever spoke properly, but, you know, only in passing at college. And I remember he was really admired at college by his, his, the, on his foundation at Wimbledon. And I remember being quite intrigued by the uh, the attention he was getting. So I walked down the road to go to the foundation studies to go and have a peep, to see what they're all sort of talking about. And, um, yeah, and it was good to talk to him for a bit. And, uh, I mean, but, you know, it's a, it's a great, it was a great show at the Tate. And, uh and, but I was saying about Frank Bowling's, um, when I was in, in his space at the, this current show, I kind of wished it was all his again, to be honest. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I kind of, um, I didn't want to, you know, I wished it was, you know, just uh, just carried on to fill the gallery again. So he should have another, another show in, a, in another, you know, in, a, in a, another year or so. Yeah. So people can really see it. Because the first time was a bit of a shock. I mean, it's taken him a lifetime to... Um, to have that show at the Tate Britain, and, and I know him. He's very ambitious. He's one of the most ambitious people you ever meet. You know, he doesn't he doesn't see himself as um, competing with Caribbean artists or even British artists. He's competing like I do, to mentally, and verbally with the best in that's ever lived. Exactly. Um, that's his drive, and that's and that's the same kind of um, ambitions I have. And um, so we have that in common, and uh, so I really admire that in him as well. And um, and I think he should have, uh, should be having more more and more of these grand grand shows. Globally. Here, here. Uh, yeah. Yes. I mean, there's no limit to how valuable or um, powerful new exhibitions can be from an artist as prolific and as important as uh, Frank Bowling. So I wholly agree with that. I mean, how many shows does Basquiat get? Does uh, Picasso get? Yeah. Etc. So I mean, yep. The problem with the art world and the, you know, it's like it, it always, I don't know if I'm wrong here or maybe I'm being negative or being a bit silly, but uh, it always seems like there's only ever room for one black person at the time to shine. Mm -hmm. And I remember like in the eighties when I, you know, cause I'm the same age as Basque here. And, um, you know, and I was, I was you know, move, making moves myself at the time, trying to get, you know, get myself up there and, you know, meeting people and showing work. And, uh, and when he came along, it was like, wow, that's him. And then basically I, I kind of felt, well, there's almost no room for me here. 
And and I was teaching at the time. I mean, I was teaching at Chelsea. I was teaching Chris Affiliate and others. And uh, and I mean, I remember think you know seeing Chris Affiliate's work and thinking you know how beautiful they were. And you know, and and I think did I um, was that um, Basquiat situation a kind of wave, uh, a wave that a one man sort of them um, you know sort of boat sailing you know sailing the waves and. Uh, and as I said, there's probably room for only one black artist to be um, to be on the on, the, on sailing the wave at any, any given time, and um, and I kind of thought, well, maybe um, I'm gonna have to sit this one out for a while, and uh, and watch also, and maybe and maybe someone like Chris might come along in, in a different kind of wave, and that's mm -hmm. what seemed to happen. Mm. But uh, you know, but you know, I worked, I paint, and I and I carry on, and I'm, and I'm worried now that. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, Frank Bowling's wave. Uh, right, it's time to ride the wave, and and nobody else is going to get a uh, get on that boat. You know, it's like um, Noah's Ark. You know, it's like two, one, one just one animal at a time, <laughs> and you know, if one animal can't reproduce, so um, it's a uh, yeah. So it's, you know, I'm a bit concerned about that. So that's one one of the reasons I'm suspicious of, of, of wave riding and mm. wave aspect because you know. I left art school and um, and I remember trying to work out ways of moving forward and 18, I left in 83, finished Chelsea and um, and, I was, and I moved to Brixton, Camberwell at the time when I when I was finishing art school and I remember standing, once, once I finished, like everybody else, you, know, you, you just literally stand in the, in the middle of the road virtually and ask yourself, which direction do I go, you know, mm -hmm. and where, where do I turn and how am I going to survive? You know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, um, you know, um, how is it going to, be going to be possible? And I remember thinking, I'm going to try and live as cheaply as possible, so I can work as hard as possible in the studio, find the studio and work as hard as possible and um, make the paintings and then see what comes of that. And, and pursue and to get better and, and, and to, you know, to drive forward and get, become a better artist and to, you know, be as good as Picasso and whatever, if not better. And I, you know, I thought it through and I, thought, and I said, really, uh, I remember thinking, uh, you know, um, I wondered, um, say, for example, did Picasso have the nine to five mentality? You know, that sort of basic working schedule. How did he work? And, uh, and, and I love this production. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be any less productive than Picasso, for example. Mm -hmm. I want to be more productive. And I remember thinking, if I try to put myself in a position where I'm working nine to five, which is the 20th century, you know, sort of um, device to get people to work, and I, you know, I could be very productive and I'll, make, and I'll be able to produce the kind of work I want to produce consistently. But, you know, I had to try and survive. And back then, in, the, in those days, I think um, it was... You know, we, we we all left art school and we signed on the dole, whatever, and we just try and survive for a little, for as long as we could in, until we get mm. teaching jobs. You know, or yeah, yeah I mean, it, that's very common. And yeah, you've <laughs> for those people who may not be that familiar with the sacrifice and dedication of those artists who have been able to withstand, you know. <laughs> The vagaries of life as an artist over decades you've given us a real real insight into that it, it's not for the yeah. faint-hearted but what's i think really important about this moment is that we're seeing new organizations um take the stand to establish space for uh some of those artists who have been overlooked and i would definitely include yeah. you in, in one of those well, um, have i been overlooked i don't know i mean i i kind of you were just saying about being the only feeling that you would there was a space for only one. Yeah, there's only one. Yeah, there's only yeah, one going to ride that right wave, saying. you know. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, I was picked up by Flowers Gallery, you know, as soon as even before I left left art school at mm. Chelsea. So I, I had that possibility and that support, and it was you know I had regular shows with them, and you know we became a bit like a massive family of artists and gallery owner and you know. Like a friend, you know, a friend group and a professional group, predominantly, and uh, and I rode that wave as, as long as I as I as I you know 
felt it was uh, positive and moving forward and um you know it had its negatives and positives but you know it, it, was, it was what it was and uh, mm-hmm. or, or still is in some extent but mm-hmm. um yeah but it, yeah they just had to just basically i don't know um how different it is um for different artists at the time you know because i remember one of my sort of closer f- um friends from the ch- from chelsea and the foundation and the dig- and the master's degree uh, steve chambers i mean i remember when he left he but he 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 was spending a lot of his time building his home and finding buying a house. He had different, obviously different financial situation to me. And he, I remember thinking he was building his home first. Then then he just read. Then he got into his work. Whereas I was thinking I'm going to build, get into the work first and see what home I can end up with. You know, mm-hmm. so it's like a slightly different different approach, a different um, angle of approach. And of course, you know, I was with Flowers Gallery and showing work internationally and. Uh, but you know, it's 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 never it's rarely as a financially rewarding as it appears, you know, from the outside. So uh, it was, you know, it's a struggle, and I work, you know, work my way through it. You certainly did, and with successes like the recent showing at the Royal Academy, you know, I'm really excited to see what comes next. And both of you, you and I, both know that there's exciting things in prospect for you. But I want to turn the conversation just to the matter of your work like your particular artistic voice, what kind of works you create. Um, And for the viewers of this conversation, they can see a background um, Mm -hmm. and that's coming from one of your works, a kind of beautiful, kind of luscious scene of abstract, like an (laughs) atmospheric um, painting with greens and and blues, uh, which kind of has you think of nature. And I know that um, the beauty of nature plays quite a prominent role in in your inspiration for your artworks can you say and I'm I'm combining a few things I want to talk about your particular artistic voice in terms of your painting your abstract painting I know you've got a particular way of talking about abstract painting but also how your painting is influenced by your particular cultural heritage your experience having grown up in Jamaica and then living your life here where do you start? I mean, where, where I mean, I, I, you know, when I ask myself this question, where did it all start? When did it start? People ask me that a lot. And, um, you know, I think it's I probably started the day, you know, day, the day one's eyes open on this world, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, I can't remember those days, but um, so when did I consciously um, became involved? As a as a child, as a four year old in Jamaica, I was born in Jamaica. I lived there till I was nearly twelve, mm-hmm. very nearly twelve years old, and uh, I had a very you know mixed uh, experience there. Um, at, um, my parents had this had me and my sister when when they were very young, and um, at one stage my grandparents, my father's parents, came along and said, "Okay." You're far too young to have children, you know. Here's some money or whatever, and go off to England or if, and go and explore life, go and, and go make a new life, and then we'll keep the children until you're ready. Until we, you know, you're grown up a bit or you know, get self-established. And um, so my parents left to um, move to London and you know, then Leeds, and left us with my grandparents in Jamaica. Um, my my dad's parents initially. Uh, there were my sister and I and um, and three other cousins living with my grandparents at the time. I was two other cousins um, from different you know fam- different uncles, and we lived in a very beautiful kind of um, environment in uh, in Gubay in Jamaica. I, I can't remember exactly where it is. Like, so I can't tell you where Gubay is. Whether it's north, south, east, or west. Because uh, when I left Jamaica, I left everything behind. Wow. Um, in terms of photography and the uh, memory of it, and um, but was it, was it kind of a rural background? Very, 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 very rural, up in the mountains. There's mm-hmm. hills and mountains and rivers and, um, wow. and lush wow. greeneries, and um, we lived in a house which was odd. It was like literally below the street level. Oh. The, street, the street went above the house, okay. so we. 
and we went down the the, the garden went down to the river that that flows at the bottom of the garden. Beautiful, wow! And we had massive boulders, and uh, and um, in the whirlpool and the in the, in the, in the in, in, and everything. But across the river was um, somebody else's place. I, I'm not I'm not sure if it's our place or not, but. I think it was somebody else. It was just, it was just wild, 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 wild greenery, and you know, and beautiful sort of greenery, and um, and that was my place as a child, amongst other places, to to wander off. And I remember, especially when it rained, it became quite interesting because we couldn't we couldn't cross the river when it rained a lot heavily, but so there was that kind of mystery. It's like um, I remember we used to my uncles we used to pole vault across the river in for fun you know just um, to get to the <laughs> okay. other side so that's like a piece of cane or something or bamboo how do they yeah. do that big stick big bamboo and we pole vault across the river for fun and and i would just go wander off and of course there'd be a time limit to how long i could spend because the river would get wider and wider and i couldn't get back so that's you know for a little boy you know that age the adventure that part of the adventure was just you know magnificent in my mind mm. And Do you think that's had a lasting impact on your relationship with yeah. nature that has really influenced you? Yeah. So when I was, when I was on the other side, um, I used to just wander off into the, on the, you know, on the undergrowth and just, and especially when it was wet mm. and sunny and raining at the same time, you can look up and you can see the sun shining through, you know? And I remember just, just being all of the world really. And, um, and just uh, um, absorbing the beauty of it, and um, trying to, and, and thinking about painting it as, as a four-year-old. Wow! Or you know, and then just be able to just write about it, think about it, and I became interested in the science of it in my own little Jamaican mountain boy way. You know, you know, obviously I didn't have the connection with the rest of the world, but um, I went, on, I went on an intellectual, emotional, scientific, mathematical whatever you want to think of it and those I went on various journeys mentally with it and um and I think I was about five or six or even maybe yeah about five six I one of my um uncles was obviously some kind of a local kind of a um, primitive artist and I think it became quite successful, successful in Jamaica actually at some stage um, I can't remember his name, but he just you know, Uncle Daly, <laughs> and um, he brought he he made a carving of a bird, which he was very proud of, and he brought it down to show, to show my grandma, and I was standing there eavesdropping and watching and listening, and I remember looking at his bird and, think, and thinking, it's all really polished and shiny, and you know, you know what I would call star as now. Okay. I could make a yeah. I think it might be Leonard Daly. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, uh, I can make a better bird than that. I can make a more realistic bird than that. And I literally went back down to the my, the other end of the garden to find um to find a bit of wood and um, got a knife and started carving and carving and carving to make a more realistic bird. And that's probably where my artistic sort of um, fine arty you know, journey sort of you know, again. But I used to do lots of different things. I used to, I was very interested in, you know, in, in the whirlpool, the science of it and the mystery of it and where did it go? Where the, where the where does the water go? And just just and the, and the way, it, you know, it connected with other parts, other, other things in the world. And just, yeah. So, and then I, you know, so that was the very beautiful part of um, Jamaica I lived in at the time. And, uh, and it offered so much, it literally did. I mean, you know, and I kind of, you know, I mean, I wish Einstein had grown up there, you know, or, you know, or Turner, you know, just like um, it had a lot of um, visual and emo emotional and, and um, you know, intellectual stimulus. Mm -hmm. But when my grandparents died and um, they, when they eventually died, my grandmother died six months after my grandfather, we had to move um, from that point from Good Bay to, to, to Clarendon in Maypen, Maypen. And uh, life was very different. I was living in a city then, in a town. And um, for whatever reason, 
my well my uh, my grandmother on my mother's side had lots of children they lived in a one room house or you know sort of moon, the moonlight let's call it moonlighting between places living you know mm-hmm. moving around very often being kicked out of out of rented property and um, you know they were very poor and they had a very very rough existence and um and I can't. We were all. I must say. I must say also that my sister and I were was always meant to be coming to England mm-hmm. from the year dot. We're always six months away. But because my parents weren't, weren't married at the time, it was difficulty with the, with the passport and with you know with um with you know with the, with the passage into England. And we're all at six months away. You know, it's, it's going to happen soon. So, so um, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's the reason why I wasn't allowed to go to school in Clarendon in Maypen from seven and a half till eleven, well, t- ten and a half. Mm. Um, so were you doing so, lots of drawing and stuff when so, you weren't at school? How were you? Yeah, so I was left alone to forge uh, my ex- my own existence, wow. and for me it was you know it was a journey. I was and um, growing up and trying to um, prepare myself for for England. Education, educating myself, and um, and I and I and I just drew and painted and did maths all by myself. I used to go outside school and stand outside school and cry, and listen, you know. To, and you know, it was like a you know, it was a really strange time for me. And I was I I was a bit what they call it. Um, I think it's become become a thing. I was like a bit like a book thief, you know. I used to steal books from churches and 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 libraries and to you know to educate myself. And I drew, and I always, I always, kept, I always drew, and, and and tried to paint. And I remember when I when I was nine years old. I meant it was after, after the moon landing. We we moved house as well because I was living in one house that when that happened, and we shifted home, still in in Maypen. A few months later, I was still staring at the sky, trying to understand the whole you know the meaning of it, and trying to understand the world and the. The distance between the planet, you know, the, between the Earth and the Moon, and all that kind of stuff, and I was staring up, trying to deal with it. And I remember it dawned on me that the world was made of color, <laughs> and therefore, if I used color on on paper or paint, I could make the remake the world. And I think that moment, I invented painting for myself. You know, whether it existed or not, I would have invented it. I invented it for myself, and. Uh, and I just remember just being awed by the by the thought and thinking. I remember saying to myself, "I'm going to make sure I draw at least one picture every day for the rest of my life from that moment." When I was nine years old in Jamaica, and uh, eventually I did spend six months. The last six months at school, I did go to school for the last six months in Jamaica for one term, and then we came to England in 1971 November. And uh, arrived in Leeds by Manchester Airport, and uh, <laughs> and I've been to start afresh, mm. and with all the cultural whatever you know differences, and um, and just trying to fit in as a normal, as you know, as a Jamaican normal, whatever eleven year old in Leeds with all the various boys and girls at the school, and um, trying to fit in and. Um, I remember also, you know, being beaten up or attacked, you know, attacked by some of the boys at school because I didn't know how to play football, (laughs) you know, because I just didn't have the cultural, I was culturally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember also, you know, some of the the Caribbean boys in my middle school, in in, in Ariel's middle school, I think there there was a level of almost like embarrassment with Mm -hmm. me, you know. There was a kind of strange embarrassment of my Jamaicanism. They used to come up with names for me. And stuff, and I remember also. I mean, it's most of the white kids that would play with me because they weren't they, they weren't then so embarrassed. There was, there was an embarrassment of my Jamaicanness, and uh, because I was culturally different, I did things differently, I spoke differently, I acted differently, and I and I, and I didn't play football. And I remember at one stage, um, the the cock of the school, you know, um, skinny. His name was. He, he decided. To, I was on his team, and I got in his way, and he decided to, he was going to beat me up. <laughs> but that ended 
not the way hoped. And after that, uh, one of the girls in my school, um, Jackie Williams, came to me and she literally took, took me by the hand and um, took me around the corner and just said, I will teach you football. Oh, bless. Yeah. <laughs> Are you breaking my heart over and over again with these I know. Of your youth? And, and she taught me to put, play football every day for about five minutes at lunchtime really? or break time. Five to you know, six minutes. She gave me a lesson in football. And within six months at the school, I was scoring more goals than anybody else in the playground. There you have it. Yeah. And what of so, painting? When did you get, when did you yeah. pick up the paintbrush again? In this well, I was, I, what I'm trying to say really is this. Unique. I was struggling to, to, to fit in. And... Um, and you can ask my 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 you know my kitchen at home was my studio at that time, and my 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 mother was always a bit suspicious as to what I was doing in there. You know, she did, couldn't believe I'd want to paint. I mean, I'd be drawing every 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 night after school, every painting, copying. I used to love copying um, English um, scenes on the on on the on the, on the potteries and on the, on the mm. you know the hunting scenes. Whatever. So as you know, I wanted to learn about England and I wanted to paint and draw. So I'd go to school as normal, trying to fit in. But as, as soon as I go home and do my homework and did the, my chores and whatever, I, I'd be in my, you know, on my kitchen table drawing, painting. And I'd build up a great, you know, massive body of work and uh, through school and try to catch up with school and everything else and being, you know, being normal. But I always try to work. And I mean, I, mean, I remember at one stage I, um, what, soon after I started secondary school at Primrose Hill, I, I had a knock. I had I had a dream. I had a dream one night, on Friday night, that I was um, playing piano in the church. And uh, and then on a Saturday morning, I'm not joking. There was a knock on the door, and I went down the stairs, peeped around the corner to see. Uh, Pentecostal preacher with his wife and some of his church members talking to my mother about me coming to church. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in God since I was four years old. I stopped believing in God at four. But um, yeah, and then um, and on the following Sunday, from the Friday having the dream, on the Sunday I was playing the piano in the church. Yeah, I was a piano player in the church, and. Um, but and also I was, the, and then you know the the church people exploited me. <laughs> now, I was their artist as well. I was painting all the pictures for their walls and their promotion. You know, as a 13, 14 year old, so I was doing both things. And I remember it felt really ripped off by the church. They wouldn't give me any money. I remember I had to literally had to take take materials from the school to to paint the pictures for them. You know, their biblical study, biblical pictures and stuff. So I was doing that. But it was nice to be useful. And, you know, I became the school artist in the secondary school. And I worked, as I said, I carry on working at home. And at one stage at, in a secondary school at Primrose Hill, I was, you know, the art room was mine. You know, literally mine, my room. And, uh, but, you know, I still had to get through school and get the O levels, the GCS, you know, whatever. And, um, a, you know, A levels and then, um, and get to college. But you know, and and I never thought, I never thought for one minute, I didn't realize, you know, you could be an artist and make a living. Mm. But I just I was just persistent and I kept doing it and I didn't and and the idea of an art school didn't even really cross my mind until I think the day before I put my portfolio together to, to apply to the foundation studies. Because I didn't, you know, I didn't know it was possible. But I was always in the garden leads. I remember actually, um, my father said to me at one stage after when I when I grew up, he said to me, he he, he actually followed me a few times when we got to, when we went to Leeds City Centre. He, he followed behind me because he didn't understand, he didn't really believe that I was actually going to the art gallery to look at the pictures. So he sort of followed me and um, secretly to see where I was going. I don't know what he think I was doing, but. So would it be yeah. would it be accurate to say that art has been your refuge for so long? Your is it refuge. your safe space? No, I I I was intellectually, scientifically curious, 
artistically curious. I was looking at books and pictures continuously from the age of, you know, zero. Mm. And, um, you know, I think I invented my own mathematical methods when I, before, before I started school in, in England wow. to do my own sub, subtraction. I invented my own way of doing it because I didn't go to school. So, I mean, that's, that's the kind of person I was. And, I, and, I, and um, refuge, I don't know about that because life is a refuge. I, you know, I, did, I didn't see myself as any kind of victim or anything. No, but why I, are you returning to this expression in this way? This is what I'm interested in. Like, what is it you're pursuing through your practice? Beauty and understanding the world, understanding myself, understanding the world and pursuing excellence. And I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. And, you know, and uh, I think I discovered um, Rubens and very, the Dutch artist quite early in Jamaica through books. So I don't know how I found out about these people, but I did. Mm -hmm. and I remember dismissing Jamaican artists quite, you know, at nine years old. What did you know of Jamaican artists at nine years old? I don't know. Where, I, I think um, it must have been TV. It must have been TV. We didn't have a TV, but we had a next door neighborhood of TV. And we also had a, my local shop in Jamaica. They had a TV. And I used to be curious. And um, I used to go shopping more often than I should. Mm -hmm. Just to go and watch the TV. And I remember, mm -hmm. you know, seeing abstract expressionist American artist throwing paint around on the TV in the background in the shop and you know be, being just moved wow. you know and um and wanting to be part of it and wanted to get to America as soon as I possibly could mm. I want to get to, as, as a nine-year-old I want to get to New York to be to be like that to to do some of that stuff and to um and and, and just TV books the books I borrowed from the church, which I promise I'll get to return one day to myself, um, my local church. And uh, and and I just, I just did it. I educated myself. And that was my thing. And I just, you know, and I did everything. I did. I taught myself to read properly. I was teaching the other kids at home, my aunt and cousins, to read and write. Even though, even, sorry, even though they were at school and I wasn't. <laughs> but... Um, I'm not bigging myself up all, but it's just it's just what I did. I just wanted to to be. I wanted to well, be um, to be, you know, a, a global artist from an early age. Well, and and Anthony, you are that, and it's been so fascinating to get a glimpse into the journey that has brought you into this status as you know a, a, an important global artist. Uh, you wrapped it up beautifully by saying that you're in the pursuit of beauty and excellence. And I can't think of a, a more inspirational or um, important legacy to leave as an artist. Um, and through your works, we get, we get access to that rich and complex, you know, there's no straightforward or uh, repeatable version of, of Caribbean history. You know, your experience growing up, um, given your parental situation, your experience in the rural background, then coming into the city, then moving to Leeds, negotiating life, you know, over here. It's so rich and complex. So there's no one version of this story. Um, and yet it's so important. So thank you for giving us access to that. Uh, we celebrate you as we celebrate all artists, uh, but particularly shining a light on the works of artists from the African diaspora, African and Caribbean background that you fall within. So yeah. thanks again. Wish you every success. Uh, with I, the, I, haven't said, I haven't said enough. Sorry? <laughs> I feel like I said nothing yet. I mean, I, said, I think I almost stopped at that. beauty. We leave people wanting more. If they want yeah, to know yeah. more about you, you know, they yeah. go to the, the website of the Gallery OC. Uh, and check out the, the show that is on, I think, until the 31st of January. If they want to know more about the wider conversation about Caribbean art, I mean, I personally would definitely recommend they go to see the Tate Britain show. But more yeah, importantly, come, must. you must, absolute must, historic show. 
But of course, come to the Black Culture Archives here, one Midrash Square. We're open to the public from Thursday to Saturday and see the phenomenal works of Rudy Patterson, another fabulous artist from the, from the Caribbean, just happens to be of Jamaican heritage as well, on show until about the 26th of February. I look forward to seeing that. So, yes, yeah. please come and visit Anthony. Please, can't wait to have you here. Okay.